I started on medication in in August and that was sort of a big game changer because all my life I've been one way and I take this medication and I mean after a week of adjusting to it all of a sudden I realized like oh, I just sat down and like wrote five pages without doing seven other things <laughs> and I feel like I could do write more. And I was focusing on work suddenly for like six hours a day solid. And so that it was, that was a big, Mm. big game changer was medication, but also, um, the coaching group. ADHD rewired episode 326. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mention on today's show you can support us on patreon sign up for our email newsletter you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups and you can learn all about our intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups you can do all of this at our website adhdrewired.com we know that starting is the hardest part so let's get started Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Marissa Marangoni. Marissa is a mom, a writer, and a former teacher. She runs Marangoni Write and Design, where she works as an instructional designer and technical writer. Marissa writes creatively and podcasts when she's not working or answering to, Mom, watch this. She loves lists, popcorn, baking, animals, sweating, and deep human connection. Have you thought about the order of that one? Like the sweating and deep human connection? Yeah, I probably should think about <laughs> reorganizing that Well, list. I guess it depends on who you're with. So True. welcome <laughs> to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, let's start with your, uh, your, your recently diagnosed less than a year ago. Yeah. Yeah, I was diagnosed in August. And what uh, tell us a little bit about kind of what brought you to uh get diagnosed? Well, it was one of those I had I knew something was off like all of my life. I kind of described it a lot of the time to people as I feel like the stupidest person in the room, but I know I'm not, but all these things that go on in my brain, I know they're not normal. Um and I just chalked it up to as just being weird. But um, it just became more and more apparent the older I got, the more school I went to that something was not quite right. I struggled with a lot of different things. Uh, And my response to that was always just to work harder. So I worked really, really Mm. hard for a really long time. And after I had my son in 2016, things just got even harder. And so I started just trying to do some research and reading about different things. And um, one day I kind of stumbled over, oh, what did I run into? I read a book, which led me to YouTube a few things. And there I ran into Jessica McCabe. And from there I thought, oh, I think I have ADHD, which I never would have suspected, mostly because I just didn't know really what it was and what it actually involved. Um, and from there I sought the diagnosis. And when you were watching the the videos and reading stuff, were there certain things that you're like, Oh, like, were there, were there like, were there certain things that you remember specifically really relating to? A lot of, some of it, I remember thinking, Oh my gosh, other people do that. I, I thought it was just me like struggling to adult or taking three hours to do dishes. Um, or trying to clean, you know, okay, I'm going to clean the house today. And it takes me, I, all of a sudden it's halfway through the day and I've done half of six different things, but nothing's actually done. And so now all of a sudden this has turned into like a multi-day project because there's so many things that I've started and need to finish. Um, that, but some of it was learning related, I think, um, just not, a lot of weird, weird things. Well, things that I thought were just weird about me, but in reality are actually my brain. 
So you had said that um, part of the challenges that you've also experienced has to do with uh, like comprehension, with the reading and processing Mm -hmm. um, language in like social, social scenarios. Yeah. And and that's, it's, that's kind of been a more recent realization. um, And more, the more I think about it, the more I realize like, wow, yeah, that's, that's really been a problem. Even what's it like? (laughs) Try try to describe it. Uh, I guess with, with reading, I can read, I, my biggest aha moment, I think with, oh, I have really have a problem with reading was uh, when I started college, my first reading assignment, I went to um, a private school that was really known for being academically rigorous. And it was exactly what I wanted. And I did really well, but the first year was so hard for me. Um, and because I re- started to realize I would coasted through K through 12, just memorizing things. And that was how I got it. I didn't understand things and I didn't mm-hmm. remember any of American history or understand science concepts, but I could remember just about anything for as many hours as necessary until I took a test and then I was done. <laughs> um, but in college, I, my very first assignment was this, a literary journal journal article about passenger pigeons. And I just remember knowing that the reading was at a higher level. So I knew that going into it, but I'm reading it and I just read it over and over and over again was like, I don't understand what this is saying. And I don't know why I don't understand what this is saying. And I, you know, it happened before. And I remember telling my mom as a kid, like, I I just read this sentence like 45 times and I still don't know what I'm reading. I think it's because it's boring. And that's what I went with for well, such a long time. Was it that you're like you were having other thoughts while reading or was it just like not sinking in what you're reading? I I think it's a combination of both. A lot of the time, if I'm not a hundred percent really interested in what I'm reading, then it's going to be kind of difficult for me to understand sometimes. And I'll, depending on, you know, how challenging the read is, if it's challenging, it may just be that I am just not getting it. What about for things that you are interested in? Even sometimes getting in, I, I think it's a part of, it has to I have to be pulled into something really quickly. And if I am not, I, it's very difficult for me to continue. <laughs> now, it's interesting, too, because you you're a writer. Yeah. So I went to school for a lot of years. I have um, a master's degree in uh, writing. So there was a lot of reading. And when I look back at it, I think I don't I don't know how I did that. <laughs> I feel like I might not have been able to do it now. Um but I just kind of pushed through and it was, you know, that was all like literary, heavy, heavy, hard reads. And I remember some of my tactics were I, I noticed a lot of patterns. So one class I had to read all, all of Jane Eyre's work. And hopefully this professor isn't listening, but <laughs> I figured out very quickly that the way she tested us on it in, um, was over dialogue and so I just read the dialogue in the books and I also uh, to get through all those books because it was a very fast five-week summer course it was five days a week where we had to read all the all her novels and I don't particularly like Jane Eyre to begin with so that was fun um, but I listened to it so I found the audio books and would listen when I was driving on the way to school and on the way back home. And then I would just read the dialogue in between. <laughs> Did you find that that actually helped with comprehension though? Like were you able to get, cause you know, it's, it's one of the things that I learned in, in grad school when I realized at the very, very end of grad school that you're really not actually expected to read everything. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wait, I didn't get that memo. Cause I was like trying to read everything. Um, mm-hmm. and it was like, oh, so I was getting like two hours of sleep, like every yeah. day during grad school. Um, and it was so one of the things that it, that it taught me was, um, I guess you can call it speed reading, but it was more of like skimming, but then knowing where to really like focus. And, um, and so I sort of learned it's like you read, you read the, the, the headlines, the, the bold print, the first and last sentence of each paragraph. Um, you know, and stuff in between is just typically fluff. Yeah. That, I mean, that technique kind of helped mostly during undergraduate 
um, which they prepped us to go to graduate school. So by the time I got to graduate school, I was pretty good with um, research articles and literary criticism, that sort of stuff. But when it came to reading actual literature, that didn't always (laughs) fly. So I relied a lot on uh, (laughs) participating in class. So I, I would... Just uh, go was, off of what so, everybody else was saying. I was always so grateful when a yeah. cl- uh, teacher gave participation points. I'm like, yep, I am showing up for that. Yeah. I mean, I, I did, I read as much as I could manage, but a lot of it, if, if I wasn't fully interested in a story, it was, it would be hard for me to remember what happened. And because we were reading really complex text, it was a challenge just all the way around. So a lot of it, like, I gained through the actual discussions in class and cliff notes. <laughs> I freaking love cliff notes. My mom introduced me to them when I was probably in elementary school. She said, did you know about these? See, now you don't even have to read the whole book. I was you, like, you're you know, so and smart. I, <laughs> I, I remember too thinking that cause you know, I was like, teachers were like, look down upon cliff mm-hmm. notes. And I, I don't think I could have made it through any of my English classes without Cliff Notes um, because it helped me like see the gist, mm-hmm. you know, and see the themes. And then I, I would actually read the the stuff. And then o- only because I read the Cliff Notes, yeah. did I, I was able to actually see, oh, OK, so these are the main ideas. Like I wouldn't have got that. And like Shakespeare. Oh, God. Ugh. Like, thank God for this, those side by side, like the, the like everyday English and then the Shakespeare yes. English. Oh, my gosh. I was so thankful when they let us do that but later on like I taught Shakespeare (laughs) when I read I was like oh I have to teach Macbeth good so reading and Shakespeare and cliff (laughs) notes and you know all the sort of the the hurdles we had to sort of get through to uh uh, to get through school I I was diagnosed when I was 19 you were not diagnosed until after you got your master's degree yeah I was 35 how the hell did you do that 34 34. How did you make it through grad school without getting diagnosed? Uh, I don't, (laughs) I don't, I mean, when I look back at school, I just remember feeling really not smart, but I was, I had a reputation for being very intelligent. And so I always felt like, man, I'm just faking this. Oh, I'm such a good faker because I really don't know what's going on at the time. (laughs) Let me ask you, this was to, um, to do as well as you did. Mm-hmm. How much did, was your social life sacrificed? It was big sacrifices. So in um, high school, I graduated, I think, fourth in my class. Wow. And I, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I... Like there were only five people in my school. I went to a very small school. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it was small. I had like 120 in our grade, but um, I remember very clearly spending... Well, basically shutting myself in my bedroom for all weekend long, 24 hours at a time and just memorizing my notes page after page. So I, I will, I do sort of have a photographic memory. I don't necessarily think because it came naturally, but because I worked so hard to memorize everything I can, I could remember like, Oh, right. That was on this page on this side. I can kind of, I can kind of do that, especially if there's, Mm -hmm. if there is like distinguishable, like markings or like a box of something like, you know, I mean, I don't know why they ever took pictures out of books because pictures are great. (laughs) Pictures are helpful. But yeah, yeah, that, so I relied on, it was just memorization all the way K through 12th grade. Mm. And so when I did get to college and when they like, their kind of method was to break down the way you learn and the way you respond and teach you to criticize and over, you know, think about and consider everything. Um, And it was very, very hard because until then I was so used to being able to memorize everything (laughs) and go uh, suddenly I, I couldn't do that anymore because everything was written tests and it was not like cut and dry answer on anything, which I love generally speaking, but it was, I just, you know, started realizing I, I, I gotta figure something out. So I started, um, understanding that I learn better if I listen 
And I had to hold back so hard on taking notes because my method was to write everything, everything. down and everybody said, and then I would miss comprehending what was going on. But it had worked for such a long time. Um, so that was a big shift, kind of realizing that I got a lot out of discussion and I got a lot out of hearing and whatever. So were, were you working as a writer? It, during, like yeah. after, so after college, um, so after what, college, I went straight for my master's. Okay. My first master's. Your first master's. <laughs> yes. So I had an MFA in uh, fiction writing and I taught, um, I adjuncted for probably six months or so. And I, I had been teaching as a part of my assistantship for graduate school. And so I've came to realize like, oh, I actually, I kind of like this. I think maybe I'll try and go from there. So a master's of fine arts is supposed to be considered a terminal degree and looked at as a PhD. Um, it's not necessarily the case anymore. And it was kind of sort of then, I don't know. Um, so I did a lot of applying. Just for people, for, people, a terminal, the first time I heard that term terminal degree, I'm like, that sounds so like awful, <laughs> right? Well, it just meant it was supposed to be like the highest level right, of learning right. you could achieve in writing. Right, unless you're going into like academics, like and research. Right. Right. And so I, I did try and I applied for a lot of professor jobs. I, um, it didn't, didn't happen. So I was teaching part-time, you know, I said, you know what? I like younger kids too. So I'll just go back to school again. <laughs> so I, I finished my master's in education, um, in English language arts for seventh through 12th graders and then worked as a high school teacher for a year after that, <laughs> then I became a writer. I mean, I was always writing and that was always my like end goal dream is to write for a living, but I loved the teaching and it didn't seem to be, I couldn't figure out a way to do the writing I wanted to do. What, what kind of writing do you, did you like to do? Really overall it's creative writing. That would be my dream, but that's not, necessarily realistic for most people and it, it is about like like short stories yeah short stories poetry. novels uh it's it's you know unless you are extremely successful it just doesn't it doesn't pay the bills yeah. so you have to figure something out so teaching is a pretty common way to do that though not necessarily high school teaching um but I ended up being a, what's called a content developer for a manufacturing education company. Okay. And um, I basically authored online education courses for manufacturers. And are you still uh, doing that? Yes, but on my own now. So I, yeah, I left that after my son was born. Um, and so you're working for yourself now. Yes. And I bet that that is uh, teaching you a whole bunch more about uh, <laughs> about your ADHD and, and, and how it you learn. Is. So it is. <laughs> more, more about that reading comprehension because I just had a project, just had one with uh, <laughs> instructions. I had to read instructions and I thought, okay, I'm going to read these instructions. Instructions like the a worst. Paragraph. It was a paragraph long. And I kept reading it and reading it. It was like, I don't think I understand what I'm supposed to do. Uh, and then, you know, so I made mis some mistakes, but I apologized and hopefully that doesn't deter future work. Uh, I mean, instructions are the worst. Like it's, I hate them. It's, you know, whether it's putting together a recipe or mm -hmm. building like furniture <laughs> or like the worst is like filling out financial forms. Like that's the worst kind of instructions. <laughs> I'm just like, it could be a, like a, wait my name goes here, wait, here yeah. at this spot. Wait, wait, yeah. <laughs> wait, 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 does my first name go here? Um, right, so, I'll put my first uh, name and it's supposed to be my last. <laughs> it's amazing how often I get forms sent back to me because I yeah. screwed them up, even though I've triple checked them because I know, I know <laughs> I screw up forms. And, you know, and I usually will also have somebody else look at the form. You know, mm -hmm. it's, uh 
forms. All right. Uh, on, on that fun note, let's take a, <laughs> uh, a quick break. Um, and when we come sure. back, I want to, uh, I want to dive in a little bit more to uh, some of your self discoveries as you're working for yourself and, um, kind of just the things you're learning about you. So, uh, sounds good. We will be right back. I don't know about you, but I have always found one of the worst feelings is that feeling of not being understood in regards to your ADHD. It can be so hard to push forward when there are so many barriers in the way, like being misunderstood, finding time management and planning difficult and stress just from all the things going on in the world right now. What you can count on is that here you can feel understood. Whether you are new to the podcast or you've been listening for a while, welcome to ADHD Rewired. We have coaching groups and alumni community and a Facebook community. And of course, our podcast. We want to welcome you to all of it. Last week, we just had our final registration event for our summer coaching and accountability groups. And as of this recording, which is on Friday, June 12th, we have two spots left. If you want to know more, go to coachingrewired.com to see if we have any spots left or to find out how you can join our wait list. If you are seriously interested in snagging one of the last two spots, pending that they are still available, so check the website or you want to get on the wait list, scroll to the bottom of that page at coachingrewired.com and send us a message to let us know that you are interested. And to everybody who signed up for this summer's session, we look forward to seeing you. July 10th. To learn more, go to coachingrewired.com. This podcast is brought to you by our patrons over at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. What is Patreon? Think of it as kind of like public radio where you can listen as long as you want to get all the value from it. It's not going to go away if you don't contribute to it but you will find value, even more value from it by contributing. And although we're not going to send you a tote bag, there are perks like access to webinars that I've posted on there at the $25 a month level. You can join us for our monthly coaching call, which is a huge perk. I want to welcome our three new patrons this week at the $5 a month level. We have C. At $10, Wayne P. and Tara L. It's our newest member at the $25 a month level. I want to thank each of you so much. If you can, consider becoming a patron at any amount you can. If you can, consider becoming a patron at the $25 a month level. Especially if you would like to join me in a small group of other patrons for an hour of coaching. Just go to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. I really do appreciate everyone's support. If you are able to support this podcast financially, I sincerely thank you. And for those of you who are able to give the $25 a month level and are going to be joining us for our next group coaching call, it's on Tuesday, June 23rd at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. At $25 a month or more, you can join us. Our group coaching calls are every fourth Tuesday of the month at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. And if you can't support this podcast financially, another way you can support us is to leave a review on your favorite podcast player or talk about ADHD Rewired in your favorite ADHD groups online. All of your support is appreciated. You know, this podcast comes to you free, but it is not free to produce. So we do really appreciate your support. To become a patron, go to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. That's ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. All right. We are back with Marissa Marangoni. Yes. I, I did get it right. <laughs> You did. Good job. I was, I, was, I was giving Marissa this look. I was like, Wait, did I do it right? Did I do it right? I mean, the, the amount of practice that I had to, to do with her last name before we hit record. And this is a very normal thing that I do on this podcast before I hit record. <laughs> um, yeah. So we were talking about self-discovery, um, working for yourself. Um, you also shared with me um, recently to that, that um, 
you also have some challenges or, or maybe difficulties around some, like sensory processing. Mm-hmm. Talk, talk a little bit about that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she says, all right. I think it's just one of those things I just have kind of, for the most part, when I realized that, that it was not normal, I just kind of deal, which now I'm starting to think, huh, I wonder if I should have done something else than just deal <laughs> with this. So one of my lifelong issues has been sleep. I can remember being very little and not being able to sleep. And I never really knew why. Um, but it's my mind does not stop. And when I lay down to sleep, it is probably way worse than it is just generally because I have nothing that I have to be thinking about. So I will pick everything. If you do the um, time when the uh, internal to do list likes to uh, remind you of all the things you forgot during the day. Yes. Yes. Planning ahead at just everything. I will think about everything. So I spent a lot of my childhood not trying to sleep, not being able to fall asleep. Um, there were even, I mean, there were years where I didn't, I didn't sleep much at all as a teenager, just because I, I, well, some of that was anxiety induced too. So if I'm really anxious, then I have even harder of a time. And I mean, this late at this point in my life, it's actually, it's, I am better than I've ever been. However, I love like a lot of specific requirements to sleep, which are not as bad as they used to be, but it's certain things like I can't, it needs to be quiet, but it can't be too quiet. (laughs) So I cannot have like noises have to be even if there are going to be noises. So I can't deal with people snoring. I can't deal with a fan that clicks but not like at the same yep. point. I, if I, that makes yep, sense. Yep. Um, I used to have a, a white noise like machine like generator that was like it was like a speaker. It wasn't like an actual <laughs> white, and you could hear that just little sort of click between the loop. And I was like, nope, yep. that is not going to do. So I can relate to yeah. that. Yeah, people will say just. I remember people telling me, trying to sleep with music on. Well, I can't do that because as soon as the song changes, I will wake up. <laughs> Yep. I can't deal with the change in volume or sound. So I generally sleep with um, white noise, like you said. That's very even, the same kind of sound all night what, long. What kind do you use? What do you use? It's just this little plug-in thing. It's nothing special, but I also have an app that I will use um, for some variety occasionally. Okay. Do you, I, I use one of the... Um, those, uh, and I think there's different companies that make them, but they're the, the white noise machines that you see at like therapist's office where it's literally like a whooshing like air. It's actually like a fan or something that's inside of there that's making the noise. That one I had, I had one of those for a while, but then, oh, I, I took it to Europe with me. Those don't <laughs> travel very well. I tried well. it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you didn't get the, uh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. No, I didn't think about that. So. Oops. Yeah, <laughs> that died. Uh, but I have a, a different one that has a bunch of different settings on it now. So it's not the fan in there, which I do prefer the fan sound over the because the electronic sound is very different. But I've come to accept the one I have. It's it works fine. Okay. <laughs> it works fine now. So sounds got to be just right. Sounds. I mean, if there's smell off in the house, like if a skunk sprays outside, I'll wake up or if. We cooked something earlier in the day. It makes it difficult because all I can think about is that I'm smelling the smell. It's not supposed to be there. <laughs> um, we have old dogs. So when they snore or move around, like it can be as small as someone moving. So I'm very, I am not a good person to share a bet with. <laughs> I'm just not. <laughs> uh, do, do you share a bet with your husband? Uh, it depends. <laughs> I would like to transition back down there, but if, if I am, it kind of goes in cycles. So if I'm having a lot of anxiety I'm, or I'm depressed, I'm having, it makes it much more difficult for me to sleep. So then I'm more sensitive to noises or anything. And so then we split up. And so I'm currently sleeping in a separate bedroom, but I'm, I think I'm ready to go back again. <laughs> It'll go for like a month at a time and then I'll go back. Mm. 
And what else? So, um, can you tell me that like you once picked up your, your husband and he had like had fast food that day or something? And, <laughs> and like you can tell like immediately. Yeah. I'm, I'm very sensitive to smell. And I think it's just, a, I have a pretty strong sense of smell. So I can tell like if somebody's eating fast food, I will probably be able to tell you that <laughs> because they smell like it. And then it used to be as, I think I told you I couldn't, um, I wouldn't eat food in my car, specifically fast food, because it, I felt like there was such this such strong scent to it that it would just get stuck in the car. And then I would smell like it, too. Um, yeah, little things like that. I, I mean, I guess to me, there are bigger things, but I think to most people, they're not. <laughs> what, what about uh, like sort of tactile um like stuff touching your skin, clothing. Yeah. Oh man. You know that like fleece, fleece blankets and stuff. I cannot stand those. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but they feel so bad to me. Like, describe it. <laughs> Just like, it feels gross. I don't know. It feels like my skin, if there's any dry part of my skin a little bit, it sticks to it and I can't stand that. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, what about like tags and stuff like that? Does that bother tags you? Tags aren't so bad. I mean, I'll, I'll cut some out here and there, but they're not, they've never been a real big thing for me. Um, but like blankets for me, I would prefer cotton. Very specifically, I don't, I don't like anything else pretty much for bedding. Yeah. <laughs> are, you, are you restrictive on uh, types of clothing you can wear? No. No? No, I've never been that way, but I don't like... I don't like wearing dresses or skirts because it, I don't know. I like to feel secured into my clothes and those are that, too. That makes sense that actually. Makes sense. No, that does, okay. that, that does make sense. So um, I do, I do love like a weighted blanket. I was just going to ask you, uh, big if you fan. deep pressure, do you like, do you like deep yeah. pressure? Like a, like a really big squeeze? Like, do you like that? Yeah. yeah. Do you get, do you ever uh, get massage? Yes. Yes. It's been a while now. It's been a while for obviously. a lot of us. <laughs> I know, but yes, I do like that a lot. What about food? I said the smell, what about like taste and, and like the textures of food? I'm, I'm not very, I'm not a picky eater, but I think texture is one of those weird things for me. I, I was, I think I was a picky eater when I was a kid. From what I remember, I had kind of a limited palate. I will eat pretty much anything now, but I it's, it has to be like mind, maybe it's matter, matter over mind in this situation. I don't know. So for instance, if I eat, uh, I love seafood, I love shrimp, but <laughs> if I eat like, I don't know, more than 12 or something, I start thinking about how they feel and then I can't do it anymore. <laughs> Wait, how the shrimp feel? Like their feelings or how they feel? <laughs> oh, no. the texture. Oh, the poor the, shrimp. No. <laughs> I mean, I could get wrapped up in that very easily, but <laughs> shut that one off. <laughs> but yeah, it's the, the texture of shrimp or like eggs can gross me out after I eat too much eggs. Same thing with a banana. Okay. <laughs> and it's always been like that. So those foods when I was younger, or as a kid, I wouldn't touch. I didn't, I just really didn't like them. Now, are there any, um, are there any senses that are not as kind of honed in? Um, no, I'm looking, no. I wrote down all the, all the senses on a list. So I would make sure I talked about them. No, no, I don't think so. I think they're all pretty intense. For pretty me. intense. Um, you know, what for, for me, I have, uh, well, you, you've already experienced my audio, uh, auditory yes. issues. <laughs> um, and uh, so I have that. I definitely uh, can relate to a lot of the, sort of the tactile um, things. Like there's certain, like just pieces of clothing. I'm like, nope, today this is not going to, mm -hmm. no. Like when you said it feels <laughs> gross, I totally can relate. Like yeah. it's like, get this thing off of me. Uh, like, yeah. And sometimes even just thinking about that thing can give me that, that sort of like, oh, no, 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 no. Um, uh I, and I wondered, because I also have a very strong sense of smell, um, mm -hmm. but my my vision has always been really bad. 
Like I have, Mine too. <laughs> I, I've always, like, even with like contact lenses in, like I mm-hmm. still have very bad vision. Um, and so I've always like wondered, like d- is like, if I didn't have contacts and, and I didn't have my glasses, like I, I, I couldn't survive. I mean, that's, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe I could, but like, it's that bad, like where I can't, my it's so bad that I can't even see like far enough to see like text in a book to have oh, it all yeah. like like I have to have like, look at one eye because if I <laughs> see it this close and then it's like crossed like the the, the vision becomes um uh, like double visioned mm-hmm. um and like I mean I remember from the time I was in like kindergarten up until my like adult way into adulthood every year when I went to be a doctor it's worse again vision's worse again yeah worse, yeah. yeah so. Uh, I- only recently, I think it, I haven't gotten over a stronger prescription, but I've had eye issues are a big, a big part of, and part of my existence. And yeah. I've, I've, I've actually had that same thought. I'm like, I wonder if my other senses are so strong because my eyes are off. Um, and it really like you, like I, I can't see a lot without glasses or contacts, but I I can walk through a dark house in the dark with no no glasses or contacts and manage not because of my eyes though because you're like, feeling your way around yeah 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 I do pretty well um but I yeah I went it, through a lot of eye issues lifelong it, glasses wear <laughs> yeah and I also need very bright light to be able to like it almost like if it's up if an area is too dark it like like my brain starts to shut down. Mm. I also used to look at the sun when I was a kid. (laughs) I (laughs) don't recommend it. But there (laughs) there was something though on like a nice summer day. I like I'll I'll look up. I'll have my eyes closed, and you feel like you can see like the red like from. Oh man, I used to do that. And and I just like there's still still to this day. I'm like I want to open my eyes, but I should. I know I shouldn't do it. I know I should (laughs) like. And there's just something about that sensation that just feels so good to me. I, it's, I am certain that that has affected my ability to like see in, in like a dimly lit environment. <laughs> it probably has something to do with that. I would think like my, I have to, I can't not squint. If I go outside, I can't not, it doesn't matter how uh, dreary it is out and we're in Ohio. So it's often not sunny yeah but yeah I, i'm i am pretty sensitive to light i definitely that as an issue um yeah i went through i had a lot of eye surgery as a kid so yeah. i have what's called um pres no no it's not now i'm forgetting what it's called good good it's, anyway it's called uh, my eyes so, cross. sounds like <laughs> yeah sounds like <laughs> sounds like my eyes cross <laughs> involuntarily and so my eye muscles are weak and I've had uh, surgery to correct that multiple times. Did you have to wear like a, a patch over a particular eye? They tried all kinds yeah. of stuff. So I did drops. I had a patch. I had, oh gosh, I had bifocals when I was in first grade. And that was before Aww. they blend them. And so I, people were always, other kids would always tell me, your glasses are broken <laughs> because they looked cracked. Really fun. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I went and did all that stuff. Oh, man. Surgery has been the only thing that's helped. And so the, I haven't had one in the last few years. So that's good. Mm-hmm. good. And it, is, it is sort of curious, like, is what these sort of the neurological sort of impact sort of in, in sort of both directions? Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> All right, so let's take another uh, quick break. When, uh, when we come back, I want to hear about uh, Holy Happy, your, uh, the, the sure. podcast that you're doing with, uh, with any of your friends. So uh, we will be right back. This week on Hacking Your ADHD, moving from defense to offense. Hey, if you're looking for something productive to do for a 15-minute break where you can actually learn about your ADHD, then check out Hacking Your ADHD with Will Curb. This week and every Monday. This week, his episode is titled Moving from Defense to Offense. 
Go check out what this week's episode is all about. Join Will as he explores ways that you can work with your ADHD brain to do more of the things that you want to do. Subscribe to these short, mindful ways to hack your ADHD. Go to hackingyouradhd.com for show notes and to subscribe. And every Friday, check out ADHD Essentials with Brendan Mahan. At ADHD Essentials, they help families develop the skills and knowledge needed to better manage ADHD. Go to ADHDessentials.com to learn more. Both Hacking Your ADHD and ADHD Essentials are both part of the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network, available to everyone, everywhere you consume podcasts. You can join me and the host of Hacking Your ADHD, Will Curb, and the host of ADHD Essentials, Brendan Mahan, for an hour of live Q&A on July 14th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash events to register for this and upcoming live Q&As. Join us every second Tuesday of the month at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern for an hour of live Q&A. Register for free at ADHDrewired.com slash events. That's ADHDrewired.com slash events. Our next one is on July 14th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Put it in your calendar. We'll see you there. All right, we are back with Marissa Marangoni. I feel like you just rolled off the tongue that time. Yeah, you got it. I was, I was like, there's this little fear there. I'm like, you're going to tell me I said it wrong. Um, <laughs> all right, so Holy Happy. Um, it's a podcast that, that you and your friend uh, are doing. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, we started that, I think, last spring. Um, so it was actually before I was even officially diagnosed with ADHD, but we had been, we just talk a lot and we grew up together and we, I thought, you know, I told her, let's work on something together. I feel like we should, we used to do creative stuff together all the time as kids. And so it's but just been a really long time since we've put our heads together. So we stumbled on podcasting and thought, well, let's, let's see how that is. Um, and we focus on the holes that mental health issues can make in your happiness, but kind of how we've worked through them. So both we've both kind of suffered through anxiety and depression um, at various points. We both also have ADHD. So, so, so you started this before you knew you had ADHD. Yeah, I was pretty, I think at that point I was pretty sure not, but you know, I thought, eh, I don't know, maybe not, maybe not, but yeah. So, um, have you been doing it kind of like on and off? That's kind of how it started, but we just started um, doing it once a month. So we're on a more regular schedule now. And um, your friend who you said also has, has ADHD, was yes. uh, she recently diagnosed or she known for a while? I think she was diagnosed when we were in like third or fourth grade. So it's been a long, long time. So over the last year, since mm-hmm. it's about, so you've been diagnosed for well, under a year, about a year, half, three quarters of a year, if I'm mathing mm-hmm. correctly. Um, <laughs> um, what have been some of the things that you have, uh, have found to be most, most helpful, um, in managing your ADHD? Um, I, I started on medication in, in August. And that was sort of a big game changer because all my life I've been one way and I take this medication. And I mean, after a week of adjusting to it, all of a sudden I realized like, oh, I just sat down and like wrote five pages without doing seven other things. (laughs) And I feel like I could do write more. And I was focusing on work suddenly for like six hours a day solid. And so that it was, that was a big, yeah. like big game changer was medication, but also, um, the coaching group. Before you get to talk about that, uh, mm-hmm. how was it emotionally for you? Like we, that you were now able to really sit down and, and focus and do work. And how was that for you? Uh, it was a little, uh, frustrating, I think, because I thought I 
so I I didn't have to work that hard all that time like I could have maybe not <laughs> been working so hard and spent more time with my friends and uh yeah so that was it was just it felt a little frustrating but I I feel like eh, I went up through everything I did so I could get to where I am I guess mm, it's a good so perspective. I'm, I'm not, yeah not angry about it just a little was a little sad at first like oh man (laughs) (laughs) only i would have done something sooner (laughs) i I very much feel you know that and a lot of people and i always feel bad too when i hear people that that don't have that experience of medication um but yeah that that feeling of man like that's why school was so hard that's why things were so hard up to this point like this could have been so much easier um, in comparison, not saying that it was ever easy, um, but easier and, you know, mm-hmm. um, so medication and, um, can I ask, what do you, what do you take? I'm on Wellbutrin to sort of manage my, um, anxiety and depression a little bit too. Okay. I was sort of like a three for one deal. She, the doctor was so is that, what you, is that what you started on? Yes. Oh, that's interesting because it's, you know, because I, I often think of Wellbutrin as a, like an ADHD medication, um, although it's it's often considered that like if you have depression uh, mm-hmm. with ADHD, that's often the for kind of a go-to because um, uh, it also works on the, the norepinephrine and um, which can also be helpful. Yeah, it was an interesting choice. The um, psychologist who diagnosed me suggested to my primary care that she put me on Adderall, okay. I think, but she, she, and I talked and she, so she knows my medical history better than he does. And she just said, I'm just concerned that it's going to make your anxiety worse. So she wants, she's like, I don't have anything against it, but let's try this first and see. And she, I think she was right on because this even shot my anxiety through the roof really? for like a week. It was miserable, oh, but really? then it's, it just sort of tapered off and I adjusted what, to it. Can I ask what your dosage is? It's just 150 milligrams, yeah, so pretty low. That's what I take too. Mm-hmm. Have you ever had any issues with generics? I don't know. I don't, I don't think so because I'm on the actual generic okay. for that. Um, just something that I personally have experienced and, Mm -hmm. um, I do think it's, it's, and I share this for, for listeners just to like observe, not saying that this is what your issue is, but just to, you know, try to, try to observe, um, when I, I I can pretty much do any generic, but when they switch manufacturers on me, Mm -hmm. the, like that first week of the switch, it's. (laughs) <laughs> no bueno. It is mm. is not good. Yeah. So I've uh um to sort of resolve that because I kept trying to get the same manufacturer, then I'd go to the pharmacy and they're like, Oh, well, you switch manufacturers again. I'm like, what mm. the fuck? You know, it's so I, I use Costco now, so at least I can get three months at a time. Um yeah. and awesome. without having to to worry about, you know, them changing manufacturers. Yeah, I haven't even thought about that, but that's an interesting interesting thing because i think sometimes what happens with these with the generics is that we you know we're struggling and we're like what's wrong with me and it's like mm-hmm. oh no like medication's changed like and you know because of the way that the you know generics work like i i do not believe that generics are the same as name brand they, i mean they probably aren't but yeah, well, the FASC is it only has to be like 80 percent as like effective oh i didn't know that yeah huh. Like I'm like eighty okay. percent is not the same. I mean, <laughs> no, it's right? a significant difference. Right. And when you're dealing with stuff that has to do with like the brain, right? Like that's yeah. that's that just pisses me off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It it's been I will say lately it's been difficult because really since December I've kind of been struggling, but I was going through so much emotional upheaval since December that I was like, I I feel like it's situational and it's not the medication. And then once I was about to stop, like get into a calmer part of life again, then all of this happened. I I mean, I give up. I don't even know what's happening anymore. (laughs) Waving the white flag. Yeah. Oh, that's rough. I Um, feel like I finally sort of settled down a bit in the last two weeks. Yeah, that's that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Um, yeah. So uh, I started taking medication that mm-hmm. helped, and then you uh, then you joined uh, one of our coaching groups. Yes. How was that for you? 
That was really helpful because I guess all my life, even when I would talk about some of the struggles I would face, I, nobody would ever say like, Oh yeah, me too. Or, or they'd say, Oh yeah, everybody, that happens to everybody. And so I'd be like, Oh, right. Okay. Everybody procrastinates sometimes. (laughs) Right. You have no idea. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, it was, it was so helpful to be with a group of people who knew exactly what I was talking about. And I'd be like, no, it really took me three days to do laundry. It really did. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or it takes me six hours to motivate myself to go outside and clean the sidewalk. I don't know. <laughs> Are you supposed to clean the sidewalk? I don't know. I was just making up a <laughs> bad example. I, I didn't get that memo. Uh, <laughs> um, so what were what were some of the takeaways? Um, I don't know uh, other than um, sort of knowing, like, really experiencing that feeling of not being alone. Yeah, I mean that that was a big one because I guess I I've always felt pretty alone for yeah. as long as I can remember. I just have always been like eh, I just never quite fit in anywhere. Um so yeah, that that was a big thing, but I mean other things it helped me. I think overall the biggest thing I took from it was to be nicer to myself mm. and I'm able to step like I, I definitely have emotional dysregulation and now I can't remember the official term for that with ADHD. What was it called? The um, uh, emotional dysregulation. There's the rejection sensitivity. Yeah. That, yeah, that thing. Yeah. I don't like that. Which is not, <laughs> which is, you know, it's, it's still kind it's of a, fun. It's still kind of a controversial term because sure. it's not in the DSM. I have, I have mixed thoughts about it mm-hmm. on, on, on one side. I think, uh, I mean, it is, there is a large sort of, uh, um, just the number of people who I hear who feel so validated by that label. Like that, that's meaningful, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that we just need more sort of research to validate it to make sure that it's, that it is in fact its own separate thing and not, like a something that's coexisting with ADHD that may mm-hmm. actually be like another already established uh, disorder. Um, you know, it's because it, it, I, I I suspect that there are many people who um, sort of identify with that rejection sensitivity dysphoria um, who may actually have borderline personality disorder mm-hmm. um, because one of the main triggers of borderline personality is perceived rejection. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's like, yeah. OK, so that's if, if that's sort of the main area, how do you distinguish like what is that and what is the other thing? Um, so uh, it's, it's just it's interesting. It's the same issues that I have with, you know, people like, uh, um, you know, Daniel Amen, who have the seven types of ADHD. It's like, well, that may be actually talking about something else that you're calling a part of the ADHD. And so it's like, you know, language matters. I think that language okay. is helpful for validation of how we're feeling. And so I think yeah. that's important. But from a sort of a scientific uh, standpoint, we got to be talking about the same thing because we got to because it, it affects how we approach treatment around this. Yeah. Makes so that's sense. that's my um, I'm, I'm going to step off my soapbox now. You're good. <laughs> to me, it was nice to just have kind of some words to put with those emotional things. And I, for so long, was like, I am just really emotionally balanced, <laughs> but I am really just not. Um, I'm pretty intense. And so one of the things the group really helped me with was to, for the first, I think for the first time in my entire life, I was, I found myself like, one day while we were still in the group, really anxious, just out of nowhere. And instead of just feeling it, I was able to lay in bed and I was like, I'm really anxious right now. Mm. Huh. And just kind of sat with it. Like, I'm anxious. Why is this happening? Okay. And that, and, and for so, and then it passed. And that was the first thing I think that's the first time that's ever happened. And so I've been able to more and more be like, okay, I feel this way but that doesn't actually mean that all these conclusions I'm drawing from this feeling are accurate Mm, because most of the time they're not. Yeah. (laughs) I was was actually talking uh, in my, I'm in a a mastermind group and this morning we were talking about um, just how, how convincing of a liar our emotions can be to what's Mm -hmm. actually going on. 
Yeah. Right. And I, I believe them for a very long time. <laughs> so it's still like a work in progress to get out of there. But even with that project I was talking about, I kind of messed up for work earlier. I was able to say out loud, like, I feel really stupid right now because I made this mistake, but I also know like, it's not, that's not the truth. And it, I was trying to, I was like, here, I feel really dumb. Now they're never going to want to work with me again. And this is what they're probably thinking. Those are just the things I'm making up that I don't know anything about. So just step mm. back a little bit. Do you still, uh, do you still talk with your, anyone from your accountability team? Occasionally. Yeah. 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 I know it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, cause I know that there are, there are lots of people who have, you know, regular meetings still, you know, uh, you know, sometimes even years after. And yeah. I talked to people too. They're like, yeah, we meet like, you know, we were meeting weekly. Then it became like once a month, but we still check in every once in a while. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's nice to, to know that people are still sort of engaging no matter what frequency it's at to know that. Um, yeah. and it's always nice too that especially if just our, with our, with our folk, you can yeah. reach out a year later and people will be happy to hear. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. that is nice. Marissa, is there anything else that you want to, uh, that you want to share? Not that I can think of. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for coming on and, and sharing your story. Thanks for having me. And where can people, uh, hear about your podcast and if they are interested in, uh, hiring a instructional designer, <laughs> technical writer, uh, where would they find that information? Well, if you're interested in hiring me, I'm at Marangoni Write and Design.com. And you probably have to put that in the notes so they know how to spell it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and holy happy, we can be found any on Stitcher and iTunes, uh, and Anchor. And um, it's spelled holy with an E in it. So H-O-L-E-Y. Which happy. is why I couldn't find it when you first. Yes. Like. <laughs> <laughs> but we're also at holyhappy.com. Awesome. Well, Marissa Marangoni, thank you so much <laughs> for coming on the podcast. And uh, you know, keep doing what you're doing and take one day at a time here with this uh, COVID-19. And we will eventually get through this. Oh. I hope so. I know. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. You bet. Be well. You too. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode. You can apply to our free and secret Facebook community. You can learn more about ADHD Rewired's intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click the Patreon button. If you're a regular listener and you're still listening to my voice, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron through our Patreon page. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to listeners, but it is not free to produce. And patrons get really cool perks. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. You can also subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube. And you can subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and see select interviews and some other videos I've posted. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends and your family and your clients, as well as your coaches, therapists, and doctors. And if you're a coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader, and you would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at my website, ADHDrewired.com. And if you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this podcast. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. 
You know, you might be the person that turns somebody on to a podcast for the very first time. And if you really love this episode, please consider hitting share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and to help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, or any other podcast app that accepts ratings and reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe on this podcast on your podcast app so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Not sure where to start? In no particular order. Check out Atomic Habits by James Clear, The Body Keeps Score by Bessel von der Kolk, 10% Happier, and Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. These are both by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions and Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Vaden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. Do you have trouble asking for help? Listen to The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. It's one of the best produced audiobooks I've ever heard. If you're looking for something a little bit more, say, magical, I unexpectedly fell in love with the Harry Potter series. And I don't usually listen to those kinds of books. And I loved it. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus yet, check out Brene Brown's books, starting with The Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or a leader in any capacity, check out her 2018 book, Dare to Lead. And Brene still is my most wanted guest. So if you know Brene, you would be so kind to make that connection for me. I would be really, really grateful. You know who else I would like to have on the show? You. Click the podcast tab at ADHDrewired.com and then click the Be a Guest button at the top of that page and schedule a 15-minute pre-interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, keep growing, and keep connecting. Self-care is not selfish, and no matter what gets done or doesn't get done, at the end of the day, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.